I'm joined by Conor McCabe, author of Sins of the Father, and uh, I think I have to say it's a brilliant book, I must say. Um, it's an, a history of the Irish economy, and I'll just read a quote. By looking at the way the Irish economy actually works, the government's response to the banking crisis, despite its inherent in insanity, starts to make sense. If you look at, over the course of the history of the Irish economy, there's never been a break no. in pattern. No, that's true. So that's true, yeah. the decisions, even though they look insane, really do make sense because they fit into the wider picture. Yeah, I mean, um, it's one of the things um, uh, about history is that, like history, it's not really, it's, um, it's not a case of one damn thing after another. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a canvas. And, and it's a canvas that is wide enough and deep enough um, that allows us to observe um, deep social power in motion. So these kind of deep kind of social forces, if we kind of step back and look at it over, over decades, maybe we can see these, these kind of numbering beasts as they move through Irish kind of society, these kind of social forces. So in what seems um, new and, um, and, kind of, and like common as uh, sensical, um, but to our eyes, in terms of this, this, uh, this, this kind of social forces moving, um, it is part of that process. So when that happens, um, a one thing about kind of looking, um, you know, at an economy in terms of power is that um, most decisions are made are about power, not about economics. So most most economic, uh, but decisions are, are really about power, not mm. not kind of serving the economy. Mm. So uh, with that focus and a, you know and a and a deep enough but time scale, it is possible to kind of tease out why things are the way they are. Mm. Yeah. And I think because. <clears throat> Because it is serving that power instead of serving the, the national interest or the, 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 the public interest, a lot of myths have come about when discussing the history of the Irish economy. Myths like the, the owning property is embedded in the Irish DNA. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange one because there are absolutely no facts for it. Um, at the moment, um, Ireland's home ownership is average in the EU. Um, it's around kind of 70... 77, 78 percent, um, it goes as high as 96 percent in parts of Europe. Um, even Germany is the, is the mid-60s, mid, uh, mid you know, as, as, as far as home ownership goes. Um, but this has kind of developed because, um, like to see it in, in terms of it's how certain sectional interests in Ireland get paid um, in order to kind of justify how they get paid, they've turned their sectional uh, interests into national interests. And one of them has been about property. Now, why uh, property you know, um, is so dominant in Ireland, um, there are historical reasons like for that, and has to do with the development or otherwise of the Irish economy over the last 80 to 100 years. There's a very subtle uh, difference. Um, there's a, a no. There is a kind of subtlety to the Irish property market that's never uh, talked about. I don't know anyone who's bought a house. Um, I know people who bought a mortgage, and then with that mortgage they've they've bought a house. But that's a different thing. Mm. Um, people end up paying one and a half times to maybe two hundred percent of the price of the house. At least, yeah. Um, for the house. So if if a house costs. 300,000, they'll end up paying 450 to 600,000 mm. for, the, for the luxury of having that house now. So mm. they're actually buying money. Mm. They're not buying a house. Now with that money, they, they, didn't, they didn't buy a house, mm. but they're buying money first. And that's where the scam happens because if, 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 if housing is based on the supply and by demand, there is a ceiling on how many houses are needed. There's 1.4 million households in, in Ireland, you know what I mean? And that's when bed sits to, and you know, up to mansions. So if you have that, that's your physicality. It's four and a half million citizens, 1.4 million households. There's a, it's a finite thing. But if you're charging for, if you're selling them a mortgage, the number of mortgage be 100,000, then it's 200,000, and then suddenly it's like half a million. So what is being supplied is credit. 
and this happens across the Western world. And um, if you look at like house prices from around uh, the mid 1990s in America, in Britain, in Australia, um, in Ireland, um, and in parts of Europe and Spain, but not in Germany or really in France, um, you'll see this uh, this curve around 97 where it really kind of takes off. And this happens, it's the same kind of curve across the world because what's happening internationally is that credit is abundant. And um, in order to turn the credit, which is not real money, because it hasn't happened yet, it's the future, um, into real money, they invest it into bricks and mortar. They're not very um, imaginative. So they know that if they like, transfer money via, you know, via housing, that somehow it, it, it'll make it like, real money. The other thing is that in the Irish, in, in the Irish housing market, um, because of the tax breaks and the Section 23 uh, in, in, uh, tax breaks, what was being kind of supplied was tax breaks. It was done via housing, it was done via like property. But what people were buying when they built um, um, an office block was the tax credits that came with that office block. So then you have an oversupply of, of office blocks as we have now in Ireland and a massive oversupply of, of housing because what people are buying is the tax break. You know what I mean? That's what's being supplied. It's done via housing, it's done via bricks and mortar, but it's a tax break. And the largest users of these tax breaks, of these Section 23 uh, breaks, were not private individuals. Um, they were institutions like banks and building societies. And as well, in the 70s, you had the government funding this artificial uh, office block bubble. And what happened was the government ended up renting most of these buildings out. Yeah, that's, that, that was one of the most disgusting things I came across in the research um, I, of my book. I, I mean, I was almost physically I mean, I was sickened by it. Um, there was no demand for these office blocks. So there was, there was tax breaks and grants for private builders to build office blocks for which there was no demand, the Irish government then steps in, Fianna Fáil government, and rents those office blocks um, off these private builders. So they're getting paid twice. They're getting public grants. They're getting tax breaks. So a tax break is not, a tax break means that everyone else has to pay for it. So, you know, the, all the services and roads and lighting and harbours and airports, all of that stuff, has to be paid for by those who are paying tax. You're hoping in a tax break that the money can generate it will be more than what they would have paid in tax anyway. That never happens. That has never happened and it never does. Mm. It's an absolute scam. But that was the worst thing. So um, in, the, in, in, the, in the late 1950s, the PAYE tax system was kind of brought in. So one million uh, workers um, have no control over um, the tax as such, it's taken from their wages as a source and the government just uses all this money and basically gives it to their friends. Mm. You know, I mean, it's absolutely disgusting, you know. And you have uh, instances like when the, the mining boom happened, the workers were actually paying more tax than the corporations themselves. Yeah, in, uh, in, uh, you know, in, or in some cases, yes, you know. Um, uh, and also, you know, there was information, you know, the stuff around how um, the tax was on profits, it wasn't on the R. Um, all you have to do there then is just not return any profit for the year. Yeah. So it would a bit of kind of creative uh, bookkeeping. Yeah. You can make sure that, that your mine is never profitable. Mm. Um, there should have been, um, uh, what's the word, in, in our franchise, but you know, it's a, it's a levy on the, um, 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 on the on the ore itself, that's like standard. No, it wasn't. It was a tax on profits. Actually, that was the scam. So Tara Mines rarely had um, a yearly profit. But sure, why would it? It's not in its interests, you know. So yes, yeah, so these were the whole things. I mean, there are so many. There are so many aspects of that. But again, just going back to why this is all happening, because there has to be a reason why this is. It, you know, it, this is happening. And one of the things has to do with the nature of the Irish economy. Um, the type of business in Ireland that, it, you know, that really kind of takes off in Ireland is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intermediary type of businessman. It's a service, right? 
So when a foreign, like when foreign investment happens in Ireland, it's those industries or those kind of services which, uh, which service those industries which boom. So in Ireland in the 1960s, it's builders because all these factories have to be built. There's land speculation because there's, there, there are greenfield sites been sold. Um, there are lawyers who have to sign off on, um, on everything uh, and there are tax accountants and, and accountants and you still see that today. I mean these are the people even, even now um, you know there was a prime time uh, 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 like program there on Monday or Tuesday that talked about how a lawyer um, can legally not tell you what he's going to charge you until after he has done the job. So you've no idea what the bill's going to be until it's absolutely finished and people get hit with hundreds of thousands. I mean, the power that these people have, they have carved up this country just for themselves. Uh, and as I said, they've turned their niche sectional interests and they've somehow made it into the national interests. An example of that is the IFSC. I mean, it's an absolute, absolute kind of disgrace. It's one large laundromat just sitting there on the, in, you know, in the docklands. Mm. And we get this, it's constantly coming out of successive governments that foreign direct investment is the primary objective of the economy. But foreign direct investment, it only they import everything they uh, all their raw materials and then they export everything they produce. The only benefit while they're here are the builders, the accountants, the lawyers, and the bankers. Yeah, I mean, uh, F F FDI just for you know it's a shorthand, but foreign direct investment accounts for about eight percent of employment in Ireland. That's kind of like direct employment. Um, uh, so the real, you know, if you bring foreign companies into your area, the, the business model should be in, in kind of supplying those businesses with kind of raw materials or with, you know, or with goods, uh, goods and services that they need. And that doesn't really happen in, in Ireland. Uh, the best example of it is, is, the, you know, is the pharmaceuticals and the chemical industry where, as you said, the, it, the chemicals are, are shipped in in containers, processed here, using Irish water and the story of, of you know, of kind of pollution mm -hmm. in Ireland because like these companies start arriving in Ireland in the 1960s when um, environmental laws in Canada and the States and in Germany are being passed and Ireland has no environmental laws, that's why they're coming here. There's lots of water and there's no environmental loss. So there's massive kind of pollution of places like Cork, you know what I mean? Um, but, uh, but they ship it in, it's processed, and then it's shipped back out again with uh, very little of an imprint um, on the rest of the Irish economy. Foreign direct investment is not a bad thing per se, but, you, but you've got to be clever about it. It's got to tie into the rest of the economy. Um, an example of it uh, that really kind of makes me laugh is uh, again just going back to Conatara Mines. There was never a smelter built for Conatara Mines, and it was all said this is what you have to do because if you export the raw materials, that's not where profit is made, it's when it's processed, that's where the profit is like, really made. But the Irish government said, Oh, Ireland's too small, it, it can't have a smelter. There were, there were two smelters built at the same time on the west of Ireland for ore that was shifting, that was that was shipped into Ireland, smelted here, and then shipped back out again. So there was smelting happening in Ireland, but it wasn't linked with the ore that was actually coming from, it, 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 you know, from Ireland itself. Again, environmental laws. They were able but to do this because there was very slack environmental laws, and they didn't have to worry about any kind of pressure group saying, uh, why are you bringing all these things in here and polluting our, our areas? Mm -hmm. In smelting it doubles the value and then further processing triples quadruples it, it exponentially multiplies then can you can turn it into car parts and automobile factories and all sorts of stuff you describe in the book the the witty island terminal as a case of the government holding all the cards and folding yeah yeah um in terms of you know in the 1980s uh, uh, shell um but makes moves into into Ireland. It is shell, isn't it? Go for it. Go for it. So this is a marathon. No, no. no. Uh, it, 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 marathon is the is the is the is, is the is is the king's Um, it's go for. 
it, it, but they move in into into Whitney Island and they turn it into um, you know, into a uh, into an oil like terminal. It's a natural deep sea uh, harbor. Um, our, uh, they needed it was it was the right place at the right time, and uh, as I say in the book, I mean Ireland held all, all the cards and they folded. Um, it got really kind of bad deals on it. The best book on it is uh, is a very is there are two great books on it. One is uh, is by Tara Jones and Alan called Guests of the Nation. It is a it's out of print. Actually, um, it is a copy of it in like chapters I saw there kind of last week. Um, but it explains it brilliantly, just the whole kind of shenanigans. And then there's a book by um, an Australian anthropologist called uh, Chris Iper. And um, his book, The Ruling, La Trinity, is a brilliant um, uh, examination um, of power and class in, in Ireland. He lived in, uh, in Banshee Bay for a year because he's an anthropologist, so he moved into the area, you know what I mean? So I mean, that's what he did. And he got a real sense of it, and he really covers just the power structures and where power actually you know lies and how it dug abuses um, itself. I drew heavily from his work in in terms of that. I'm more than happy to acknowledge that, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, but you know, but again, it, it goes back to if you're getting paid by servicing international, you know, by corporations, what they do after that is not your concern. But it should be because it's it's national policy. But that's not how it works. It's all about well, we'll get paid because we'll get to build these terminals, and we'll get those contracts. That's how we get paid. So, so it's all mm. like that matters, you know. Mm. But uh, they had an opportunity to charge them ground rent or harbour fees or something like that. Yeah. And then there was uh, they they set up legislation to set up a local authority, but. They never gave them any powers to do anything or to charge any fees or anything. No, like no, it didn't because uh, it, it, uh, they set up um, a, a like Bantry stops at the at the um, at the dock at the harbour uh, dock itself. The, you know the Bantry Council, mm. like something like that. So the you know terminal is on the islands that are in the bay. So that was being run by a kind of file, and um, they set up. Um, a harbour uh, uh, authority, but the people who are in charge of it, it's good. Cool. So they're in charge of it, so they, don't, so they don't charge themselves anything. I mean, it's just incredible how much money yeah. was it was lost at a time, and God just couldn't believe Giving them a little chunk of Ireland. Giving them a little chunk of Ireland, which they then they polluted, yeah. and uh, it caused them the deaths of, uh, I think, 50 yeah, 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 Frenchmen and but three Irishmen as well, yeah. and you know, and then um, they just they were just kind of let rip because again, all that the Irish kind of this sectional interest, whose second national policy, all they saw was building contracts. We'll get building, we'll get building the contracts out of that. That's it. We get paid. That's all that matters. Paye pays your tax. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah it's you know. Ju- I think it's just the, the best example of the government doing everything they can, going out of their way for a multinational interest instead of protecting or upholding the national interest. Yeah. And I think that's the story of the Irish economy. Well, I mean, in, you know, in like Banshee Bay, uh, there was a local, um, I think it was, uh, they were um, a, a, a deficient, um, or the fishermen in the, in, in the bay itself. There was more fishermen working in the bay that were employed in the you know in the in the terminal but the leaks from, from the terminal shut down those jobs yeah. so actually cost even in net terms it costs jobs because um a deficient the very small kind of a, a cottage industry that's closed down but more or less um because of oil leaks and the jobs that it replaced there's less jobs you know and it's absolutely crazy the war against the Irish fishermen. The war of oh, well, I mean that's a story in it, in itself. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, what's that? What was it? Uh, Kili Beggs is another natural deep harbour. It's twelve meters deep, even even at low tide, you know. And I mean that should be like that should just be one huge suction pump for the entire Atlantic Ocean, just going through into 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 Kili Beggs, whatever 
the quotas are, it should be just taking them all. Yeah. You know what I mean? Instead of being like, carved up by, by Russian, Icelandic and Spanish uh, interests, you know, it should be all just like funneled into it. So they can still be quotas, but all the quotas like go through kind of killing bags. I mean, that place should be just like buzzing. But it's not. I mean, it's, it's a dying town. You know, it, you know, you know. Uh, it really begs. Uh, um, it lives off. Um, uh, like it, 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 what do you call them? Um, it, it had cruise ships. So it was six. Because like it's so big that cruise ships can actually come into the into the port. You know what I mean? Town, yeah. You know what I mean? I you know up until they got and that's how it gets paid. You know, it's because they, because since the nineteen seventies. Fishing has just been, uh, fishing, uh, Ireland's fishing rights were traded to keep the ranchers happy. You know, and like you go past the pale, <laughs> and we all, I mean, this is just a common knowledge, you know, that that, 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 that was a trade off, you know. Mm. The, again, just going back to the entire minds, uh, uh, the um, irony of like ironies is that by the 1980s, early 1990s, um, Tara Mines is completely nationalised, mm. but it's not owned by the Irish government, it's owned by, I, I was going to mix it up, it's Norwegian or Swedish, it's one the, <laughs> I just can't, I just have to check, but I, I, I think it was the Norwegian. Oh, to Kumpu or Boliden. Boliden, yeah, yeah, I think so, but it was the, now that was subsequently but privatised anyway, but at that time it was run by the, by the Norwegian state. So it's completely nationalised, something that the Irish government always says can't happen for Terry Mines. So it was nationalised, but it's nationalised by the Norwegian government, not by the Irish government. Mm. And it's in Ireland, mm. you know. Mm. Um, again, it goes back to who's, who's getting paid on the back of this, mm. you know what I mean? Um, I mean, corruption is just rife in Ireland, in an Irish society. So you have to think, it's not unreasonable then to ask, is there something going on here as well, you mm. know? Is there a bit of smoke? Navin, it wouldn't have been just a mining town, it would have been an industrial city. It could have been, yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we're viable employment and that's what you're supposed to do with, with um, industrial um, development. It's not about building kind of greenfield sites, it's about having it linked in an organic fashion with the rest of the economy. But if your sectional interest is, is based around construction, once the factory is built, you've gotten paid. So, so why would you care about you know anything else about kind of linkage or any of that stuff forever? Mm. All you got to care about is getting them in and then getting someone else in. Just keep on building, building, building because the building is only part of it. If you have building, then you have tax breaks for that building, and you have then speculation on it. So it's three pronged, you know, um, approach, and that's what happens in Ireland with uh, with kind of commercial property. I mean, Ireland has had three. Um, a commercial property boom and busts. There was one in the late sixties, early nineteen seventies. Again, in the in the early nineteen eighties, and and now the present one here. Now, it's the first one that has that has coincided with a housing bubble burst, but it's the third kind of you know a commercial property one. And that again, that's never talked about in the you know you know in the newspapers. It's always the householder who has who has bought this down. But um, of the two kind of tranches. Uh, of loans that were sent over like, to NAMA um, under the last government, uh, I think it's something like 33% of all those loans um, have to do with, with greenfield sites. So really, you know, if people look at a, you know, at a NAMA development or a NAMA uh, like loan or, or whatever, um, if they're driving from Drogheda down to the airport, if they pass by, if, if they look out at any of those green fields, Nine times out of ten, they're looking at a NAMA, at a NAMA investment, and it's just an empty, an empty kind of bean field. And they were given almost, I mean, they were given, you know, seventy percent of the value of a green of a of a of a field that's been earmarked for kind of development that never happened, but it was still, it, it would Irish taxpayer is still have to cough up for it. These are green fields. These are empty fields. You know. The scale, I mean, I was once saying this at a talk, it is, it is operatic, uh, the corruption in this country, it is Wagnerian, it really is, it's just, it's, I mean, you know, it's titanic, it's, you know, it's, it's just incredible, just the scale of it. Is it unique in the world? No, it's not, but I mean, again, you know, I mean, if you look at Italy or Spain, 
that you know it's it's as endemic there but the type of kind of capitalism is different in Italy and Spain well not really in Spain but certainly in Italy than it is here in Italy they do make things they make cars yeah. they have olive oil I mean they actually make things whereas Ireland it's a service based thing. it's a service based kind of capitalism so the employment is lower and uh, and uh, and uh, and the kickback to the rest of the economy is kind of much lower. So it's not just it's not just kind of corruption, that's that's everywhere. But it's a type of business that's taken off here. It's very much a sectional interest based on servicing um, at, at, at like multinationals or pre nineteen seventy um, the live cattle exports over to over to Britain. You know, mm. so it's a, it's a it's it's not just monocausal. It's it, it like I, like I just said, it is everywhere. Mm. But again, it cannot be separated from the type of business model here. And this is part of our, of our folk memory. I mean, like, again, I always say this, is that anything I say people know already, hopefully all I'm doing is just sharpening other, you know, other lens for them. Um, but the idea, but the folk memory of the gone bean man is, I mean, that's it. The, uh, the gone bean man is the shopkeeper. He's the middleman. He's the one who's getting paid, you know, by the landlords like to collect all the rent or he's the one who you know he's giving people loans you know on the monday and they have to pay up on the friday you know but but that's there for a reason because that is the irish business business model and it hasn't changed mm. you know what i mean it's gotten i mean the the suits are flashier uh, the accents are a bit are a bit kind of haughtier but the business model hasn't changed and that's like how how does power reproduce itself? I mean, how can something last sixty eight years if it's just individuals, if it's just Charlie Hoy, if it's just Liam Lawler, if it's just um, who was your man who was a ball of trees in like North County Dublin, the the Pina Fall, like uh, uh, you know he went a Ray Bork, right? So if it was just them, if it's just bad apples, why is it constantly bad apples? Yeah. There has to be something systematic that is just churning these people out and, and that's that's where the real problem has to get at and it is deep I'm gonna, and, and because it runs so deep in our society it's not insurmountable but you but we have to really start digging at it and digging at its, at its roots you know mm. and we have to peel away all these myths and point it out but it's I think a starting point yeah hopefully you know I think it was Ray Crotty who said Ireland is unique in that we have this model of undevelopment that we never want to develop the country. And I think that singles us out from other corrupt countries in the world. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of the raw material in Ireland is being exported for development. Mm. Um, in the Ray Crotty, he had ideas about it being lazy or like so forth, I wouldn't agree with that. But he is right about, he still had something about the on development. Again, I would, I would argue about something different. I would say that Ireland is was and still is uh, linked with one of the most advanced industrial economies in, in the world. Its role in that economy wasn't very sexy. It was to provide cattle for the uh, slaughterhouses of England to then feed, feed the, you know, all, you know, the kind of factory workers. Um, so it was, or the, or the cities more than the factory workers, like to feed the cities. Uh, so it's not very sexy. But the principle is still the same. You're exporting a raw material, in, in Ireland's case, up to the 1970s, cattle, which is then processed in England where real value like we can takes off. I mean, um, as an example, in the 1940s, uh, in the 1930s, uh, Dev, through pro protectionism, um, a shoe industry of sorts, like, took off. In Ireland, but in the nineteen forties, there's a crisis in the in the in the Irish kind of in the Irish kind of shoe industry, because um, it's running out of hides, uh, the leather hides. But where it's getting those kind of leather hides from is from England and not being shipped over because of the war. But what was going on is that there are these thousands of, of like live cattle that have been sent over to England, slaughtered, tanned, and then those hides are then sold back to Ireland. I mean, so even on what they make selling back. The hides pays for the cattle in the first place. Everything else there is just, it's free for them. Mm. You know what I mean? And this is seen as normal or like natural. Why wasn't Ireland just starting them here and, you know, making shoes with, with the hides from here? Because, you know, I mean, this is the whole thing. So, 
but Ray Crotty, he was right with a undevelopment. I would have different views as to as to why that kind of took place. I see that's kind of raw material be it, it being kind of shipped out, and that and that ties into the into the iron ore or you know sorry into the into the zinc. Yeah. You know what I mean? That 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 real value happens somewhere else. You yeah. know, Ireland's role is a you know it's colonial. I mean. You know, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it still has that kind of colonial a relationship, where at the periphery sends all the raw material to the core, uh, to the core uh, center, or no, sorry, but to the center where value is added. Yeah. You know. And whether the the colonists be Britain or the EU, it's always the same. Well, yeah. I mean, well, yeah. I mean. Um, in Ireland now, its its role in the in the EU is to is to uh, is is to wash tax from f- from kind of financial um, like products. I mean, Ireland's role in the shadow banking system has been completely downplayed. It's it's on, the IFSC was one of the pillars of the of the international shadow banking system. Now, uh, Dr. Jim Stewart of of the Trinity College has been going on about this for years. And again, you kind of get more mainstream than a Trinity College economics uh, lecturer, um, senior uh, lecturer. Where is he on the telly? He was on, actually, he was on prime time, I think, in the glass. It was the first time I've seen him on TV in years. But um, like talking about the IFSC, so it's starting to kind of get through. But he's covered this like time and time again. I mean, uh, he wrote an excellent paper there uh, there recently. That said that uh, the main the main beneficiaries in Ireland of the IFSC um, are tax accountants, and the reason being is that if, if what you're selling is um, well, if, if if what you're selling are like tax breaks, then you need exp- like as a foreign company, you're coming here for the tax breaks, then you need someone who knows that tax law. So you hire them and they move up or the ladder. So, so he was saying that, I think it's something like 67% um, of all senior managers um, of companies in the IFSC, I, I'd have to check this figure now, I'm sorry about that, but it, it, it's something like that war former kind of tax accountants and they've worked all the way up. These are the main, kind of, these are the main uh, beneficiaries. They know how to work the books. Exactly, and you know, and, and it makes sense because I mean, if that's what you're selling, then that's what the companies are like, coming for. They're not coming for Ireland's, you know, educated workforce. Ireland is a low wage economy. I mean, this is your myth. Um, I mean, in two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, um, of PAYE workers. So it's not all income; it's just of wages of PAYE uh, workers. Um, at the median wage, the halfway point was twenty six thousand euro gross. Now this is never mentioned. It's always feels like forty thousand. That's the average and so forth. Listen, twenty six thousand gross. That was the median wage. Two thirds of all workers earned less than than uh, thirty six thousand uh, gross a year. So if you're earning more than like twenty six thousand a year in Ireland. You like you're not part of the of the of the one percent. But you certainly are part of the of the of the thirty three percent. You are in the minority, but that's the majority. If you if if you look at prime time, there's no one who's interviewed or to give their opinion on things who's earning twenty five thousand a fucking year. Mm. These are guys that are. I mean, th- their world is not the world that we live in, mm. not even close to it. But on the on the one percent, a very interesting figure is that I think the, at the top sixty to seventy thousand. Uh, PAYE workers, and this is just our income purely from their wage now, and as much as the bottom 660,000. I mean, the disparity yeah. is just incredible. But that's wage. Um, it, 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 the higher that your wage is, um, it, uh, the more kind of likely that your income is not based on your wage, it's on other forms of income. So you have things like shares or bonds or investments. Um, these are, this is how you make your money as you earn kind of more money. So you know, as a ratio of your income, and your wage kind of like drops off. But if you're earning twenty five thousand a year, it's pretty much certain that your wage is your income. Mm-hmm. But if you're a Pat Kenny, your wage is part of your income. Mm-hmm. 
and this is the change. And, and if you look at Ireland's kind of tax laws, um, almost two thirds of Ireland's annual tax comes from PAYE and, and income tax. So it's people you're know, buying stuff and then the tax on that. 100, uh, out, of, out of 44, 42 billion euros in tax, 166 million euros is in, it comes from capital gains tax, which is the tax on money that's been used to make money. It's the worst form of investment because it's just money making money. There's nothing that's happening. 166 million, it's a pittance. So that just shows you again about power that you know if you're if you're a wage earner and your income is, is more or less on a wage you are being completely screwed in this country. If you if um, if your if your income is part of your wage but also from your investments, your uh, those investments because of the types of, of kind of tax breaks and tax incentives in Ireland, you end up paying virtually nothing on that. You know again sectional interests being passed off as national interests. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we go back to, to, to sort of where it all began in 1922, um, pegging the punt to the sterling, who benefited most out of that? Well, it's the banks. I mean, it's the ba- I mean, I mean um, the ranchers kind of did as well, but only the, only the top kind of ranchers. But really, even they didn't kind of benefit from it because, um, I mean, it's similar like, to the situation in, in Europe now where the weaker, uh, the weaker economies have to use uh, the euro and the euro is being kept artificially high to sue France and Germany basically because they want a good strong uh, like euro. It would really benefit Portugal, Spain, Greece and Ireland if the euro devalued. It would really help us but that ain't going to happen. And a similar but dynamic is happening with the pound. Um, uh, Irish banks, there's about seven or eight um, like private banks, shareholder-based banks. Um, and from 1922 until 1979, uh, the Irish, Ireland's the currency um, is being, the, uh, the, um, the like management of the Irish currency has been run in the interest of the shareholders of those eight banks. So they want, they take people's savings and they invest it mainly in the UK because they want to make easy kind of profits from money, making money in the UK um, instead of being forced to invest that in Ireland. As is the norm with a with central bank and a central currency. This is normal that investments, that, uh, that savings in the country are used to invest in the country itself and expand that economy. That doesn't, that doesn't happen in Ireland. In the 1930s there are farmers complaining that credit is too expensive so they can't upgrade or develop their, their land, they can't buy fertiliser because fertiliser is being imported into Ireland. I mean, I mean agriculture is the, is the largest industry and we're importing fertiliser. Um, in the nineteen in the nineteen fifties, we're importing milk. You know, I mean, this is this is how it's like it's so geared towards cattle and, and like live cattle. It's unbelievable. Um, I don't want to bore people if if, if the dual purpose like shorthorn, but yeah. it, it's it. But I I just I was fascinated by the but the kind of mechanics of of beef and and like dairy and. Uh, well, anyway, it's a, it's not a story, but that's very. I think that's very interesting because is. the shorthorn is not a dairy cow. No, it's not. But like, you know, it was it was being kind of put forward as one, and the reason being is that uh, small far- in, in Ireland, small farmers basically raised uh, calves, sold them on after a year onto the onto the fatteners, who then sold them on, on onto the finishers, who then export them to England for. Uh, for slaughter and sell the hides back to Ireland and then sell the hides back to Ireland. But like, you know, even in the nineteen fifties, uh, there was a, there was an American consulting firm called IBEC. It's just coincidence that it's the same as the as the you know as the business you know uh, 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 organization. But um, but they're astonished at what Ireland is doing, and they can't understand. It. And these are good American 1950s capitalists, and they cannot understand why Ireland is. They are literally watching money walk away, and just saying, 
we're standing here on the docks and we're watching money walk away here. I mean, even down to even down, but to the spinal columns of the of the of the cows. Uh, there's a form of chemical uh, in medicine that was being used at the time. Again, I'm I'm a bit uh, vague on the on the details now, just on the memory. But um, they were saying that you could use that spinal fluid as the basis of a of a pharmaceutical industry here, and you're just like you're just like throwing it away. There's the hides, there's the spinal fluid, there's the meat itself. I mean, what are you doing here, lads? Mm. But uh, but partly of that. Part is that the ranchers are dealing, their main market is Britain, um, and most of Ireland's imports are coming from Britain and, and Northern Ireland. 88% of Ireland's imports in the 1950s are coming from Britain and, the, and, and Northern Ireland. But it, it, but it meant that money was quite expensive for expansion, so even the ranchers who wanted to diversify or expand they were being held back by the fact that the credit wasn't really there it looked for that. So the banks were really, they ran this country in their own interests, you know, and it held us back in so much. And this is part of the reason why in the 1950s, um, it, like Ireland's dying, Ireland has the highest uh, birth rate in Europe and an aging population because of, well, because of of immigration, but also because of of, 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 like, of the rate of, of the child deaths in the in the country, and one of the things that happens when when you have um, a live cattle industry is that um, you have more cases of TB because cattle pass TB onto onto humans. So the whole kind of no brown thing ties in with the with the TB as well. This was literally killing us. I mean, I mean, this was literally killing the Irish people. You know what I mean? And even that didn't make them change their policy. No, 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 didn't give a damn. Um, and, the, and, and this is, I mean, this is the 1950s. Uh, this is where, you know, this is the time, well, it wasn't just in the 1950s when if you were a working class child and you end up in a, in a justice school, you know, skill, you were abused, you're beaten, you're raped. You know, this is in the newspapers. I mean, these, well, in, 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 in not the rapes, but the, uh, but the physical abuse and the deaths caused by, by, uh, by, uh, by religious, they end up in the in newspapers. This wasn't hidden. People knew about them, but they couldn't do anything about it because it went to the guards. The guards weren't interested. If the guards weren't interested, the judges weren't interested. You know what I mean? Nobody cared. So this is the attitude at, at, at the time. People wonder why Irish people drink so much. I mean, there's a darkness in your yeah. soul. There's a yeah. darkness that no one really wants to talk about, you know what I mean? Um, and it's just there, it's part of it's just it's it's ingrained in us, yeah. you know. Um but like what was the, yeah, it's, um so it's ranches couldn't really expand, um it, the Irish economy is 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 dying. And the solution was, well, if we can't tackle the banks and their and their grip on Irish monetary that policy. We can't really tackle other ranchers and their live cattle export business to Britain. Although that was changing because Britain was starting to build up its own model at that time. Um, yeah. So and um, you know in the in the nineteen fifties, uh, uh, Irish monetary uh, policy, the, uh, these these group of of the private banks have a grip on that. That it is a central bank. In Ireland, it's set up in 1943, uh, but the first thing they say is, there's nothing to see here, we don't really need to have a central bank. Having a monetary policy run by a set, a set or eight, like private banks, in the interest of those shareholders, that's fine. There is no other country in Western Europe that's doing this. Even in America, there's the Federal Reserve. You know what I mean? So, uh, in, in Britain, there's the Bank of England. You know, so, like, the importance of the like, monetary policy for the expansion, expansion or contraction of the economy was well understood, but the power block was it, it was so great that there was no kind of shifting there, um, and no government would kind of take them on. Same with the ranchers and the lot of kind of, uh, it, it kind of cattle export, although they start to see the writing on the wall in the nineteen fifties. Britain wants TB kind of like cleaned up in Ireland and for and for cattle as well, but a solution then was seen that. If we import credit into the country and import the industry, nobody has to get upset. We can have jobs and have expansion and everybody gets paid. Happy New Year. 
And that has become the, the economic model since. And the reason why it has become the dominant economic uh, model is that those who get paid up on the back of that, they reproduce themselves. So that it goes back then to builders, land speculation, lawyers and accountants. Um, these are the people who, who, who really benefit from, from that type of economic model. And is it true that the central bank used to used to walk into a borough to change and get sterling and use that as their reserve for Ireland? Well, it's what they used to do was buy sterling notes. So, um, I mean, I I say that in the book, but it's it's kind of like I wouldn't cheap. be surprised. But it's the same principle. Um, and what what underwrote the Irish uh, currency was the amount of sterling notes which the Irish government held. And again, I back, I back the American a, 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 a consultancy firm couldn't understand this. They were going, what, why are you buying notes? This is crazy. At least buy government bonds because there's an interest, you know, a return on that. They weren't even buying UK a government bonds. Now, I need to do more research into why that, it, it, that is the case. There has to be something about the financial interests of the UK banking system I and mean, this is obviously a two-way system mm. someone's getting paid on both ends so we know about like what was happening in Ireland they were just buying this is the Irish government uh, through the central bank was buying sterling notes and uh, you know <laughs> which which nobody could really kind of like understand um, but that was their model at the time there needs to be more kind of and more kind of research done on that into just exactly why that was done yeah. but there has to be someone on the UK side getting paid as well you know so that's what so is it there. safe to say that the, the central bank is sort of run by the six shareholder banks more or less well like monetary policy was you know so I mean the full like monetary policy that was being run in the interest of the, of the shareholders of those bank because because any time it was put forward saying this isn't helping the national economy, uh, the banks said, well, our job is to look after our shareholders, we're the private banks. Well, if that's the case, then take a monetary policy off their hands, because that's not what um, a national currency is for. They were getting all the benefits of a nation state being run for what? How many hundreds of other shareholders? I mean, a small group of people were getting all the benefits of a nation state purely for themselves, not for anyone else. And they were getting away with it. And of course they like still do. I mean, um, again it goes back to how deep this runs in the you know in, in our society. There is, I mean, like this is why I say in the book, um, when you start to see this, it it makes sense how they were able to turn on the head of a pin their problems into air problems overnight. You know, and we're able just to dump her all onto our shoulders virtually overnight and then just walk away, you know. Uh, it wasn't the first time they did it either. No, it wasn't. I mean, in 1985, um, uh, ICI, which was a subsidiary of, of, of AIB, uh, that went bankrupt and Gareth Fitzgerald gave him a blank check. He was asked in the, in, he, either, he, either he was or Alan Jukes was asked in the doll how much is this going to cost the Irish people? And he says, we don't know, they don't know. We're just writing them a blank check. I mean, this is, this is 2008. Like, you know, this, um, it, 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 this happens in 1985, but it's, it's virtually the same speech which, uh, which Brian Cowan and, uh, and, and Bon Ahan give in, in October 2008. You know, say, oh, we don't know, it's just a blank check and that's the only way, you know? And that's how deep, you know, it runs here. So do you think it's a sort of a civil servant thing that as soon as a political party gets into power, no matter what they say in opposition, they carry the ball for the previous government's policies? It's, it's part of it. I mean, it is linked. I'd see it more in terms of class, that, um, and, and that both um, you know, senior kind of politicians in Ireland and senior civil servants, and also the senior management of the church are coming from the same class. They, and in some cases, in both senses of that word, I mean, they come from the same class and even in school. You know, I mean, the schools, they were talking about Blackrock College, you know, uh, Wesley, you know, I mean, these are the schools 
uh, that are coming from. This is the class that they're coming from. So it's a class interest that's being kind of served here. And, uh, and, the, and the senior kind of politicians are coming from that class. And I, and I should say that uh, it, it, when I talk about class, it's not just in terms of kind of social class, but an economic class as well. So that when you enter into that class, their interests it become your interests. So when, when you have someone like Bertie Ahern, who's a millionaire, uh, like for all that he says he is, you know, he's a millionaire, his interests in, are not the same as those who want 25 grand a year. He may be from a good, a working class background. He is, he's a, you know, he was, he was, he was a working class, uh, a, a, you know, a man. He's, you know, he's, he's from that area, but not anymore. And his interests, he knows kind of very well, aren't, aren't, aren't those interests anymore, you know? And, and, and I say the same about, about, um, about, about Charlie Hoy, he was the son of, a, of an army sergeant. He was, very, he was always very kind of insecure about the, you know, the fact that he, he came from a non-Republican, uh, non-middle class kind of background. But he enters into that class and he takes on their interests and become his interests. That's, that's the thing about it. It's not about the person. It's not about a category. It's about an economic interest. And uh, and once you sign up to that, then that's yours, you know. Um, do you want to just uh, uh, briefly mention um, how the book came about to be written? Oh yeah, yeah. It, um, uh, I've I finished up on me on my PhD in two thousand and seven, uh, and um, and I and I'm from even more in in the in the north side of Dublin, and I wanted to write a book, just a very small book, just a very like tiny little story. Of the history of Eden Moor, like this year, well next year is the 50th anniversary of it. The first houses were built around December 1961. So I thought it'd be, it'd be nice just to write it just a small story and interview all my neighbours, you know. Um, but as I started in that, um, I'm a late 19th century, early 20th century labour historian. So I was entering into the 20th century really for the first time, you know. And I just assumed that the type of overall overarching and narratives that I would need in order like, to tell a very small story, you know, the, the kind of shorthand saying, well, this is, the, like, this is what's going on, that would be there. And after about kind of six, seven months, I, I, I went, it's not. What I need isn't there. I mean, there's been no real study of work in art in, in, in the 20th century, even in kind of sociology. I, I'm just amazed by this. How, how would you not study the, the, the type of jobs in Ireland and the development of that over the last 60, 80 years. So as I started into that, um, I started kind of digging more and more into the, into the economic history of Ireland and why we have the jobs we have, uh, why we have the social system it, you know, it, it, it we have, in order then to make sense of why these social houses were built on the edge of Dublin in the early 1960s. You know. um, and, uh, I, I blog a lot, so I was putting this up on the blogs, kind of like, oh, I, 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 found this, I, I found this kind of today, and then, you know, I put it up. And um, History Press Ireland read it and said, are you thinking of writing a book about this? I said, yeah, I am. And said, so um, are you thinking about writing a book maybe on the present crisis? Because at this stage, it's like 2010. I says, well, I can, I can change it around. I mean, I, I see it all, all linked. So that was really it, and then I wrote the book. Um, so hopefully now I can, I have to write, I think, another two more, and then I can write about even more. So I'll get there in the end. But it's great just taping, I mean, I've started taping, you know, on my neighbours. And, uh, and it's great, you know, just like calling up to them. Because um, you're always 10 or 12 years of age to your neighbours. Because they know you from just being a kid. So it doesn't matter what age you are, you're still, oh, that's Niall's son. And you're still like kind of going around everywhere. That's how they see it. So I'm just walking in, talking to them, and I'm just talking to you as if you're ten or twelve. It's like still, I I love it. I I think I think it's great. And you're doing like they think I'm doing a project for school. You know what I mean? And n not because they're going to see it, just like because they just see it as that is, it's not just me, just neighbors. Like the. Look like the men and women, you know, you know, who you know, who are neighbors in your area. That's how they see it, and you never grow past that age, you know. Um. So hopefully, I'll get around to that. But like, but but now that the overview is in it is in place, you know. 
but uh, places like Edenmore were sort of would you say they, very cynical to say they were buying votes to be housing people like that well I mean but there was an, an element like to that I mean like Fianna Fáil um, Michal Martin said this back in 2002 it's not just a new thing but he was on uh, questions and answers when that was still going and there was someone from Labour there and he says, but well, Labour was never the party of the working class in Ireland. Fianna Fáil was. The Labour party and I was squirming. Because he knew that Michal Martin was right. Um, there's over, there's about, at the moment, there's about 360, 380,000 trade union members in Ireland at this moment. If they all voted Labour, Labour would be the party of government all the time. Obviously, they don't. You know, part of them vote on Labour, but the majority of them would have until the last election have voted on the Fianna Fáil and there are reasons for that again this is where I'd say this is where I reach the limits of my book it's a skeletal kind of framework of the development of the economy not of our society and you cannot understand our society everyone looking at things like the church Fianna Fáil as a social organisation and not just our political organisation the GAA of course you know so I mean that, that these are the limits of, of my research up to now, you know, it's very much a scale it, it you know kind of framework of the development of that. So yeah, there was an element of kind of buying votes, but and by the by of the nineteen sixties, Fianna Fáil TDs aren't really coming from work class areas anymore. You're starting to get the, the kind of mohair suits and the new money people. And also the sons and daughters of the first generation of the Fianna Fáil TDs who would have, like I mean, like Sean Lamas, he was born uh, in, uh, on kind of Cable Street, you know what I mean? Um, uh, uh, Todd Andrews, you know, he was the, he was the father of, 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 of Niall Andrews and all the Andrews kind of Buddhists forever. Uh, and I think the uncle of uh, Ryan Turberty, you know, so I mean, like that or second uncle of his dynasties <laughs> yeah exactly but but Todd Andrews was a working class man like he came from the he came from the class mm -hmm. that voted for him by the by 1960s that, that's starting to kind of you know a, you know it a, a, a off and now even in the last in the previous kind of thing for government the majority of them are gonna like teachers accountants lawyers it's all professionals you know like Michal Martin is like his dad was a busman but but that's the exception as far as kind of Fianna Fáil kind of TDs now bear to your hair of course you know but if we're only talking about individuals at this stage so I think by 1960s they are buying votes I don't think they're doing it in the 1930s I think that would be cynical because they're from that class and you understand how horrendous the housing is uh, but by the 1960s I think they're the sons and daughters of the parents who've done well. They've kind of lost touch a bit, you know, kind of with that. And certainly by the 1990s, sure, I mean, Charlie McCready, you know what I mean? Mm. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, Charlie McCready, Jesus wept, you know? So I think by then, by the 1960s, there is an element of that of kind of buying votes. Most certainly. The bus pass and things like this. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's the it's it's a small gesture. It's, you know, it's a tartar sauce. Obviously, you know that Simpsons where where Homer is making the middle of management and he and make sure that it, it all the all, all, all the workers have larger portions of kind of tartar sauce. Have you seen that one? No. And that's his, and love him. It's like he's like more tartar sauce, <laughs> right? And they love him. All he's giving them is just like a larger portion of like tartar sauce. Yeah, yeah. And that's the bus pass, like a larger portion of kind of, Burns is still there yeah. making his money, yeah. but they have more kind of tartar sauce, and, and that's the bus pass, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, like this is the gimmick then because by the nineteen sixties, there are TDs in Fianna Fáil who are becoming millionaires. And it's not because of their wage, <laughs> mm. you know. I mean, this is what's happening, you know. Mm. So, yeah. Brian Cowan had a, a few properties in Leeds. Did he? Oh, at the no. time, oh, right. A few um, student apartments, and it really suited his business portfolio to guarantee the banks. You know? <laughs> so I didn't know that, but like you know, I mean, even he, I mean, you know, his father was it was a TD, but he was a publican as well. You know what I mean? So you know, they were doing all right. Mm. Again, you know, it's that. 
you know, I mean... The Gambian class. Yeah, it is, you know. I mean, I, I actually have a bit of time for Brian Kelm, I have to say. I mean, I know that sounds a bit strange, but, um, but I, like, you know where he's coming from, and he is what he is. You know what I mean? There's a certain honesty to him. Even if he is a Gambian man, there's still... There's a certain honesty to him which you don't really get with uh, it, 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 it with other kind of TDs. Yeah, know? and it goes back to what you say. Like uh, I think you said Padre Pio could have been in charge of Anglo Irish Bank. It's yeah. not the main, it's just the way it's the game is set up. It is, you know, and like, you know, I mean, like Count just should never have been have been T shock, you know. He should like he he should, he probably should, he he probably like just should have stayed just managing his dad's pub. But uh, his dad died young, so he was expected to to kind of take the shoes, you know, he was only about 23 or 24 when he made it on or, or, or TD because the farthest seat was gone, so he had to run for it. Even this idea of a fucking dynasty, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a crazy idea of it. Um, but again, that's not important. It's not about it's not about people, it's about how the system works, you know what I mean? And and they just kind of churn these in these guys out, you know? I mean, if you take I mean I, I'd rather I'd rather be in like Brian Cowan's, a, you know, in a company than Ender Kenny's. You know what I mean? If, if like, if you were at a wedding, I'd rather be at that table with <laughs> Brian Cowan because, because like, you'll have the crack. There'd be more points flying. <laughs> There'd be more points flying anyway than with, uh, you know, uh, Michael McDool. Could you picture oh, being yes. at a, you know, at a table with all the PDs? It's a different class, you know what I mean? Um, and Kenny, you know, again, it's it's it, it, it's the whole thing. But again, yeah, if you see it in terms of people, you it's missing the bigger picture that how power it, it reproduces itself is never challenged in Ireland, you know. And I see that in class terms. They uh, more or less they're coming from the same class in many times in in many ways the same kind of social class. But definitely, when they get to that position, they've entered into the same economic class. And there is a difference, you know, between social class and economic class. Economic class is a lot more basic. It's a lot more. Uh, it's not as kind of nuanced, you know. Um, but but they do kind of enter into that, and once they do, their interests are not our interests. 